There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. Amen. I want you to open the Word of God with me, would you please, to the Gospel according to Matthew, to Matthew chapter number 21, and we're going to pick up right where we left off in the Bible study hour. We are studying this week in parallel to the week we're living, the most important week in the history of the world. If I ask you this morning, what's the most important week in history? And people would talk about certain wars and turning points and the coming to power of certain people, and I don't know what comes to your mind, but let me tell you on the authority of the Word of God that the most important week in history was the week that our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and rose again from the dead. Because that week did not just touch time, that week touches eternity. Do you understand that if our Lord Jesus had not come and lived through this week as He did and died at the end of this week as He did, and then, praise God, rose from the dead at the beginning of the next week as He did, that you and I would have no hope, none. Now, the whole reason for which we're gathered here today, the whole purpose behind uh, the songs we sing and the prayers we offer, all of that is what our Lord Jesus Christ accomplished for us in this one week. What a week this was. And so we are living, beginning today, in the week that commemorates that holy week. And today is known by most people as Palm Sunday and next Sunday, Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. And I think it's a very good time for all of God's people to hit the pause button and say, let's go back and just meditate again for a few days on what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us and the impact that ought to be making in our lives today. And so we begin, Matthew 21 and verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. Let's pause just a moment, would you please? I had you mark in your Bible in Mark. You can mark it again here in Matthew 21. The Lord hath need of them. The starting point was a donkey, literally a little colt that our Lord is going to walk, ride rather into the city of Jerusalem on. And so it begins with a picture of His humanity and His humility and His royalty, His deity, His glory. This is the portion of Scripture that describes what is commonly referred to as the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. And I noticed something just a moment ago looking at this verse again. Did you see the word in verse 2 that's repeated in verse 3? It is the word straightway. Straightway you shall find an ass tie in verse 2. Verse 3, the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send them. That word literally means immediately. In other words, right now, don't hesitate. May I say to you, when the Lord comes to town, immediately things begin to change. When Jesus shows up, look, don't tell me the creator God of the universe came through the place and it made no difference. I tell you, when the Lord arrives, immediately things begin to change. Notice verse 4, all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, we, we looked at this earlier, it's Zechariah chapter 9 and verse number 9, if you want to write it down on the margin of your Bible. And what was the prophecy? Verse 5, tell ye the daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and on a colt, the foal of an ass. It's interesting to me to see that the king is meek. As a general rule, when you think of leaders, people who are in charge, the boss of something, 
Meekness is not the first thing that comes to mind. Can we agree on that? In fact, sometimes it's even construed as arrogance because uh, the, the person in charge is the guy decreeing what's going to be done. You're going to like it. You're going to do it whether you like it or not. And I'm, I'm in charge and all that. But when the king comes, I love this. You talk about loving leadership. He is the meek king. The meekness of Christ is always connected to the ruling presence of Jesus Christ. He's never out of control. He's always under control. And he always brings everything else under his loving rule. In fact, Matthew chapter number 5 in this same book, you remember our Lord's first sermon? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Interesting, isn't it? This beautiful, meek authority of Jesus. Verse number 6, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and here's where the story really gets interesting, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. So here's the picture. Stop just a moment. Here's the picture. Our Lord gets, gets this little colt that he's going to ride in on. It was prophesied five or six hundred years before this day happened. Isn't that powerful to reveal the wisdom of God and God fulfilling his plan? But before he gets on it, the disciples take their coats off and lay their coats down like a saddle, if you will, something for him to ride on, on top of this little colt. Our Lord gets on top of the colt and They begin to make their way into the city of Jerusalem. And when they do, the crowds are already there. It's the feast day. It's the holiday. They've gathered to celebrate the feast of Passover this week. It is the busiest time in Jerusalem of any time of the year. People are everywhere. And it is a very festive atmosphere. And in the midst of all of that, the mob looks up and here comes that rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, the teacher, the one who's healed and raised dead people. And he's not walking, he's riding. He's surrounded by a group of his followers, a group of his disciples, and suddenly, what overtakes them? You tell me what overtakes them. There there had been no advance team. There had been no promotional posters put out. There, There had been no instruction given to the multitudes. It was the Lord at work, God offering his son to them, presenting the king to them if they would have him. And immediately, something grips their heart. Remember, Zechariah, rejoice, shout for joy. And that's exactly what they start doing. And first, they start taking their coats off and laying their, imagine this, laying their coats down for the donkey to walk on top of. And then cutting down palm branches and laying the branches of the trees like carpet down for the donkey that's carrying the Messiah to walk upon. What is this? There's, there's only one person they would have done this for. They, <coughs> they would do it for the ruler, the king, the emperor. The person who deserved the highest place, it was a a picture of great honor that they said that all that we have is given to you. All that we are, we we honor you. And that's what they're doing to Messiah at this moment. By the way, to point out the fickle nature of man's heart, that five days later the same people will be crying, crucify him. Tells you how hard the human heart is, isn't it? deceitful and desperately wicked, how quickly we turn from saying we love the Lord to denying Him, how quickly we turn from saying we want the Lord to rule over us to saying that we don't want His Lordship in our lives. Look, they are a picture of us. And here they are laying their coats and branches down. It's really symbolic of the fact that Jesus should be Lord over all. Somebody says, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Wonderful, I hope you are a Christian. But may I say to you, the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't just want you to know Him. He wants you to yield to Him. And I wonder today, could we take our coats and give them to Jesus? Could we take the things most dear and personal to us, the things that bring us the greatest comfort, and could we lay them down so that Jesus Christ truly is King over all and all things are placed under His feet? For the record, someday that's where everything is going to be, is under the feet of Jesus Christ. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord help us not to wait to the end day when the King comes back to make that declaration. May that be true in our lives today. And so we come to our verse. Verse 9, And the multitudes that went before and that followed, 
Don't, don't miss the picture. There's, there's a group of people coming out of Jerusalem, and there's a group of people coming along with him from Bethany. So he's got a crowd pushing him, and he's got a crowd coming out to meet him. And together they start crying out the same thing. What do they cry? Saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, who told them to say this? I'm going to show you in Scripture in just a moment that this was a definite prophecy. Just like the donkey was prophesied, this was prophesied. These very words were given. I would go so far as to say to you, God the Father put these words in their mouth. At this moment, the Lord is fulfilling prophecy and He is giving heaven's validation on earth of who this man is. This is not just any man. This is the God man. This is not just another rabbi. Excuse me. This is the Messiah. And it made quite a stir. Look at verse 10. When He was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved. Paul, lift your head and look me in the eye just a moment. How many of you would like to see this whole area moved for the Lord? Would you raise your hand? May I say to you, there's only one way that happens. And it's not when the preacher comes to town. It's when the Lord moves in. When Jesus begins to be seen and heard and loved and admired and worshipped, listen to me, God always inhabits the praises of His people. You want the Lord near? You enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. Look at them. Jesus has come. They're acknowledging Him, and the whole city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. By the way, that was right, but it wasn't far enough. He was the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee, but He was much more than a prophet. Oh, look, church, He was the fulfillment of the prophecies. Do you understand? He's not just the messenger. He is the message. And Jesus, verse 12, went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said to them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, now don't miss it, and the children crying in the temple, and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were sore displeased. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany. And he lodged there. Now watch this. From verse 1 to verse 17, you have Palm Sunday. Would you like to know what happened on this day in history? There are books out, you know, on this day in history. Would you like to know what happened on this day, this Lord's Day, this Palm Sunday, triumphal entry day? Would you like to know what happened on this day in history? It's found right here in 17 verses. It, it all started with a donkey. And our Lord begins this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He is presented to Israel. Remember, He came into His own, and His own received Him not. He came to His own world, and His own people did not receive Him. So the reality is, He's presented to the Jew first. The Jews are going to reject Him. We know that. And so then He gets presented to the Greek. So it's to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Uh, I'm speaking as a Gentile. I'm glad it's not just for the Jews. But in Matthew chapter number 21, our Lord is presented. And it's interesting to me, really interesting to me, that the one group that didn't want him were the religious people. Can I tell you who the worst sinners are? Religious sinners. People say, I'll tell you, that drunkard out there, well, he's a sinner. He needs Jesus. But it's a funny thing to me that sometimes it's the worldlings that get it and the church people that don't. In fact, very often when God begins to move in an area, it doesn't always start with the people who know the most Bible. And you know why I think that is? I think because sometimes we know so much and do so little with what we know that our light has become darkness and we've become dull of hearing. Could it be that the religious people among us today will be the ones who miss it? <laughs> Could it be? Now, I'm speaking as a religious person. People would say, I'm a religious person. I'm a preacher. I'm in church almost every day of my life. 
That's pretty religious. Did you know you can go through all the motions and mechanics, all the form and function of it, and you can still miss Jesus. The children acknowledged him. They honored him. They worshiped him. But it was the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees that said, do you hear what these people are saying about you? Full of skepticism and full of criticism. And I love this. Jesus pokes them in the eye. Look at it. He says in verse number 16, have you never read your Bible? Who are these religious people? They were the people that knew more than everybody. They had all the answer. They knew that already. Remember what Paul said, knowledge puffeth up. Well, they were puffed up with themselves. And he said, have you never read that out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? He said, have you ever never read in your Bible that when Messiah comes, the little children will recognize who he is? Oh, the beautiful simplicity. Do you see the repetition? It was, it was a simple donkey that Jesus uses to ride into the city. And now it is the simple praise of the children that testifies to who he is. God is revealing his son to us through the most simple things. What a great God we serve. This morning, I want to zero in on one word. In fact, I'm going to preach a one-word sermon. How many of you would like to hear a one-word sermon? Some of you say, praise God. We've been waiting on one of those for a while. Well, don't get too excited. It's going to take me a few minutes to study the Word with you. It's not my Word. It's a Bible Word. It's found three times. Did you notice the Word? It's not a Word we use much anymore, but it's a Word the Jews loved. Oh, they loved it. It was an old Syriac Word in its origin, and they loved to use it. It was a worship Word. It was a heart Word. It even sounds like a heart Word when you say it. Would you look at it, please? Mark it in your Bible. Matter of fact, I'm going to read again. When I stop, you say the next word. Look at verse 9. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, that's the word. Mark it in your Bible. Verse 9. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. What's the next word, church? A second time we find it. And again in verse 15. The children crying in the temple and saying, what's the first word out of their mouth? Would you mark it? Three times in your Bible. In fact, it's found six times in the gospel records. You find it three times here in Matthew. You'll find it twice in Mark's record and once in John's record. And if you wonder, well, what's wrong with Luke? Why didn't he use it? The answer to that is that in Luke's gospel account, he basically gives a definition of, of what Hosanna brings. He said, grace and peace. I love that. How many of you know we need grace and peace? And so basically, look, please. Hosanna is the word that brings God near. It brings all of heaven's resources to bear right here in the midst of the mess we're living in. Do you understand that in the Roman Empire, the world was at this moment so wicked and so far away from God, and there was a political mess, and there was an economic mess, and there were, was a moral mess. Does that sound familiar to anybody else? And in the midst of that mess, a word just, boom, cuts through it all. Hosanna. Now, what is this word? It's an exclamation point. That's what it is. A divine exclamation point. It is a word of, of adoration. It is a worship word. When I get done, when I get done, I hope this word will only mean more to you. I hope you'll start using it. I use it in my prayers. When we get done, in just a few moments, we're going to have a season of prayer, and I'm going to ask everybody in the room that's breathing. How many of you are breathing? Would you raise your hand? Good. If your neighbor didn't raise their hand, check on them, would you please? If you're breathing, I'm going to ask you to join me in one of two prayers. And if you say, well, I don't know which one it'll be, you'll know. You'll know which one is the one for you. But I'm going to ask you to join me in one of two prayers because here's what we're going to do. Look, please. We're going to try to come near to our Lord this week just as these people came near to God. And the word that helps open this to us is this amazing word, Hosanna. And understand that you've got to figure out where it came from. So let's take a little journey. Hold your place here. Now don't lose your spot. We're coming right back. Put your right hand in Matthew 21. And with your left hand, I want you to run back in your Old Testament with me to the Psalms for just a moment. The Psalm 118. It is one of the Messianic Psalms. It is a psalm just before the longest psalm in the Bible, Psalm 119. And in Psalm 118, you're going to find a most amazing portion of Scripture. And I think when we read it, you're going to say, hey, I think I've heard that before. Well, look at Psalm 118. The Bible says in verse 
Number 22, the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. Tell me, church, who's that talking about? Who's the cornerstone? That's right. Christ is the chief cornerstone. He was rejected by these religious people, but he is the chief cornerstone in the church that God is building. Look, please, at verse 23. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Could we all just stop there and say, yes, Lord, it is marvelous. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping us understand that this is the Lord's doing. Don't miss verse 24. We quote it. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This day, a day to rejoice. This day, the gift of God. This day, the Lord's day. We say Sunday is the Lord's day. I still believe in the Lord's day. But I would remind you that for a Christian, every day is a Lord's day because every day is the gift of God to us. So if you're breathing, you're alive today, this day is God's gift to you, and you ought to give it back to Him. Could I point something really interesting out to you? Did you know Psalm 118 is a part of a section of psalms? There's three or four psalms right here together that are known by the Jewish people as the Jewish Halil. Now, that, you say, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. Well, let's go on to it in just a second. The Jewish Halil, they would sing during the feast days. So the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Dedication, the Feast of Passover, they would sing through the Jewish Halil. It was their hymn book. It was literally their song book and, and the way they came to worship God. And they would sing this psalm. This is powerful. Do you know that the Scripture we're reading right here, this is the day the Lord hath made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it was the portion that would be read as they came to the Passover. Do you remember on the night of our Lord's betrayal and arrest? He had that time with the disciples in the upper room. You remember? He instituted the Lord's table. He washed their feet. Everybody remember? And what does he do before he leaves the upper room? They did something. Anybody remember what they did? They sang a hymn. You ever wonder what they sang? Somebody said they sang Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. No, that song hadn't been written yet. You ever wonder what they sang? According to Jewish tradition, they had just celebrated the Passover, and our Lord now had instituted a new supper out of that, not old but new, do you see? His Lord's Supper, His memorial supper on His way to the cross. According to tradition, when they finished that meal together, the song they would have sung would have been a portion of this Jewish halil. Now ponder this. This is, this is, this is powerful. On his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, on his way to betrayal and desertion and denial and arrest, on his way to suffering at Gabbatha, on his way to the cross to bleed and die, Jesus sang, This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to tell you something. The day of redemption is a glad day. A day never to be forgotten. May God help us never get over what Jesus did for us on the day He died for our sins and what He did in our hearts on the day He brought that salvation to our hearts. The hymn writer wrote, Glad day, glad day when Jesus washed my sins away. How many of you remember the day Jesus washed your sins away? I tell you, you must never get over that day. Don't stop there. Look at verse 25. Matter of fact, I want you to read the first two words of verse 25 out loud with me, church. Ready? Here we go. Save now. Would you take your pen and write in the margin of your Bible, right next to that, the word Hosanna? Same word. Somebody said, what does Hosanna mean? Is that just a nice sounding word? No, it has meaning, friends. There's a message in the word. What does it mean? Say it, please. Hosanna means what? Save now. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now. You might want to mark, save now, send now. Do it now, Lord. Save now, send now, prosperity. I love this. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Does that sound familiar to anybody? We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even under the horns of the altar. Remember when they sang this? Passover. Just before the lamb is slaughtered. Just before the sacrifice is made. Watch, please. When did Jesus sing it? On his way to the cross. Look what he's saying. 
Father, bind the sacrifice with cords. Bring it to the horns of the altar. Let the sacrifice be received. Let the salvation be procured. Save now, O Lord, Hosanna. That's powerful. They tell me that these Jewish people, you see the parts of the verses. See how there's two parts to each one of these verses? They're in halves. They tell me that the Jewish people, their tradition was one group would sing the first half, chant the first half, and the other group would chant the other half back, almost like a responsive reading to one another. And I got it in my mind. I may be wrong about this, but if you go back to Matthew chapter number 21, the Bible plainly says there's a multitude before him and there's a multitude behind him. There's, there's the people following him from Bethany and there's the ones coming out of Jerusalem to meet him. And I have a pretty good idea that they are chanting these things back and forth to each other from the Psalms. Look what the worshipers say. Hosanna to the son of David. And someone says, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. And back and forth, what are they doing? They're lifting up the lovely Lord Jesus Christ. Hosanna was a word they understood. They used it. It's foreign to us, but not to them. In fact, did you know when they had the Feast of Tabernacles, When they had the Feast of Tabernacles, it was an eight-day feast. It was fascinating. And the first seven days, they would go around the altar where the sacrifice was one time each day. And you know what they would chant as they went around the altar? Hosanna. And on the eighth day, oh, this is wonderful. On the eighth day, the final day of the Feast of Tabernacles, they would go around the altar seven times. Remember, seven is the number of completion. And seven times around the altar, guess what they would chant? Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Seven times. You know what they called that day? They called that the great Hosanna. (laughs) May I tell you a little secret? Jesus Christ was God's final full forever sacrifice for sin. And on the day that that sacrifice was being brought to the altar, on the very week that that sacrifice was being brought to sacrifice, oh, I love this, God was presenting the great Hosanna. God was coming to man. Any other sinners in the room glad that when we couldn't come to God, God came to us? I'm telling you, something on the inside ought to well up inside of you and say, Hosanna, praise God, save now, Lord. Let me show you some things about this word. Would you write them down somewhere so you can meditate on them later? Number one, I want you to see, first of all, that it is a prophetic word. It's a prophetic word. I showed you that already from Psalm 118. Prophesied thousands of years before The arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ on the scene, they said Messiah is coming, the sacrifice is coming, the King is coming. So first, it is a prophetic word. And I just want to remind you that though the whole world may be in an uproar right now, and though there may be lots of questions and uncertainty, that the God of the Bible has everything forever settled in heaven. His word does not change. It is impossible for God to lie. And some of you right now that are a little worked up watching the news, can I give you a recommendation? Turn the news off and open your Bible. Because I want to remind you that the God who's always kept his promises is always going to keep them. And so first of all, Hosanna is a word of prophecy. Number two, write this down. Hosanna is a personal word. Notice, it is Hosanna to the son of David. This is not to a movement. This is not to a church. This is not to a group. This is not to an ideology or to a creed. This is to an individual. It is a personal word. It is to the son of David. Who is the son of David? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 1, takes Christ all the way back to David in this royal line. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Listen to me, please. His very name, Jesus, means Savior. What do we all need? We all need one thing. We all need a Savior. I'm looking at a bunch of people this morning I don't know. Now, God knows you. And you don't really know me. You're still trying to figure the preacher out. Well, don't try to do that. God knows me. Let's just get it out of the way. Let's just get it out in the open. You ready? I'm a sinner and you're a sinner. You're looking at a dressed up sinner. That's all you're looking at. And I'm looking at a church full of them. So congratulations. Welcome to the club. Turn and look at the person next to you. Look at the person next to you. Don't look at me. Look at the person next to you. Stare at them just a second. Some of you sat next to the wrong person. I'm sorry about that. Look at them just a second. You know what you're looking at? You're looking at a certified sinner. That's what you're looking at. Some of you wives are saying, yeah, that's right, preacher. You're exactly right. But the truth of the matter is we're all sinners. And you know what sinners need? Sinners need a, a Savior. Save now, Lord. Hosanna, Lord. 
Do you see, it is a prophetic word. It is a personal word. By the way, when the Savior comes, we'll come back to this and study it more tonight. He changes everything. Look down at verse 11 and verse 12 and verse 13. He comes into the temple in verse number 12. And what does he do? He cleanses in verse 12. What does he do in verse 13? He teaches. What does he do in verse 14? He heals. Oh, I love this. When the Savior comes, when the, when the Lord moves in, he changes everything. He cleanses. He teaches. He heals. Oh, Hosanna, Lord, save now. Don't you know that's what we need at this moment? And then there's a third thing I want you to write down. Hosanna is not only a prophetic word and a personal word, it is a present word. It's a present tense word. Save, what's the next word? Now. And we think of our God as a God of the past, but God's not just a God of the past, He's a God of the present. We say, well, the Lord's coming someday. Well, He is coming someday. But He's not just a future tense God. He's a present tense God. The psalmist said He's a very present help in time of trouble. Lord, we need to know Your name. Pharaoh wants to know Your name, Moses said. Tell us what Your name is. And the Lord said, just tell him I am. I am what? Yes, all the above. The eternal, self-existent, all-sufficient, ever-present God. He is the great I am. And I came this morning to tell you on the authority of the Word of God that the God who was, is, and the God who has, can now, and that God is very present at this moment. God has not forsaken and forgotten His people. God forbid we should think that. God has never failed us, and He's not about to start today. Hosanna, Lord, save now. Remember what Paul wrote? Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In just a few very short days, our Lord Jesus We'll go to the cross. Do you know what that was? It was an answer to the prayer, save now. There's a fourth word, fourth thing I want you to write down about Hosanna, a lot in a word. One of God's words could change your life. Number one, it's a prophetic word. Number two, it's personal. Number three, it's present. Number four, it is a promise word. It, it not only has a past tense and present tense component, it does have a future tense component because I want to tell you, the same one that rode into Jerusalem the first time, praise God, is coming again. In fact, our Lord is going to set up His throne and rule and reign from the city of Jerusalem. Anybody looking forward to the day Jesus rules this planet? Perfect peace will only come when the Prince of Peace comes, and He'll set up His kingdom, and He'll rule and reign for a thousand years, and we will rule and reign with Him. Do you remember what Jesus taught His disciples to pray in Matthew, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount? Thy what? Kingdom come. What's the last prayer of your Bible? You know the last prayer of the Bible? It's found on the last page of Scripture, Revelation 22. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's the last prayer of your Bible. You know what it's a prayer for? It is a prayer for the king to return and to have his rightful place. I wonder, when was the last time you so loved the appearing of Jesus, you looked up into the heavens and said, Lord, come today? When was the last time your greatest longing was not for you to get out of your mess, but for Jesus to step into it? It's not our disappearing we long for, it's His appearing. And when we say Hosanna, what we're saying is, Lord, we believe You always have been. We believe You are right now, but we are asking that as surely as You came the first time, You will come again, and when You come again, You will set up Your kingdom and rule and reign. Save now. But then, there's a fifth thing that's very important. Would you write this down? It is a praise word. Remember, we're in a worship service. That's what we're in. We're in a real worship service. And look at our verse, verse number 9. They cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. And what's the next word, please? Blessed. Would you circle that in your Bible? Blessed is He. This is our word to God. You know, God is the blesser. Can we all agree on that? Every good thing in your life you have because God gave it. He's the blesser. James said, every good and every perfect gift cometh down from above from the Father of lights in whom is no variables, neither shadow of turning. So look, please, every blessing comes from Him. Watch this. But what are we supposed to do? Those of us who've received the blessings are supposed to turn around and we're supposed to bless Him. When was the last time you blessed the blesser? Even when we talk about the blessings, aren't we stinking selfish? Even when we talk about the blessings, we're always talking about the ones we receive. No, no. When was the last time you relayed blessing back to God? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. People say they want revival. They don't want a revival. They want a preacher to come to town and preach a few sermons and show them something they've never seen before. That's not revival. I'm going to tell you what revival is. Revival is when God so moves in 
And the conscious presence of God becomes so real that every one of us stands in humble awe about who God is, and it changes our lives forever. That's what revival is. It's not about man. It's not about me or you. It's all about God. People think if the preacher preached better sermons, we'd have revival. Fooey on that. We've made Christianity a spectator religion where somebody on a platform performs and everybody else sits around as spectators. I tell you that the moving of the city was directly connected to the praising of the people. What sermon was given? Did Peter stand up and give some fine sermon? No, Jesus showed up and the people acknowledged him and started to praise him. And watch this, when you begin to praise God, God loves the praises of his people, the Lord begins to move in that situation. You want to see this city turned upside down? You want to see this town stirred up? You want to see somebody say, I don't know what's going on over that church house, but something's going on over there. We need to check it out. I'm going to tell you how to have that happen. Don't expect me to preach sermons that accomplish that. Instead, you go out of here today with the high praises of God in your mouth and start talking about the goodness and the greatness and the glory of your God, and I tell you, God will work in and through the praises of His people. Let the redeemed of the Lord what? Why is it the world is saying so and the Lord's people are not? Hosanna is a praise word. Let me show you something interesting. Look at verse number Look at verse number 10. When he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved. Would you mark the word moved there? All the city was moved. Did you know the word moved is the same word that's used in the New Testament for an earthquake? That's interesting to me. You remember when the Holy Spirit showed up? What happened? The place started shaking where they were. Watch this, please. When Jesus came to town, The Holy Spirit began to move and shake and stir. I'm not talking about a physical thing. I'm talking about a spiritual moving. Oh, may God Almighty send the kind of moving in our nation that we so desperately need. Look, we don't just need better politicians. We need God's people to acknowledge who God is and let God be God among us. And I tell you, when Jesus comes to town, you can't hype it and you can't hide it. There's no substitute for it and there's no shortcut to it. When God comes to town, everybody's going to know. And by the way, what's the question they ask? Look at it. Who is this? Can I tell you praise is the most powerful witness there is? People say, well, I'm going to learn how to give the gospel. I'm going to learn how to give a track. I'm going to learn how to give my testimony. You ought to learn how to do all of that. But I'm going to tell you the most effective way to witness is to praise God to somebody else. There's lost people out here. The only Christian they've ever met is a sour one. And if they met a sweet one that was full of the love of Jesus and the joy of God, they just might desire to know your Christ. Now I want to say to you, when God's people begin to live in this spirit of praise, it begins stirring everything. Oh, look, it brings God glory. It's best for us because we find the joy of the Lord in it, but it's a great testimony to other people. It is a praise word. And there's one more thing, and I'm done. It's a prayer word. Remember, it's a petition. Save now. Remember I said to you that this is a word you ought to use in your prayer. I prayed with one of our brothers who's here this morning, here on the front row a few minutes ago before church started. We prayed for one of his family members that's lost. And do you know what I prayed? I didn't pray, Lord, we we hope he'll get saved someday. I could have used the word Hosanna in my prayer. I didn't use the word, but I basically said the same thing. We prayed together, and I said, Lord, save them today. Work in them today. Lord, save them now. Let me ask you a question, church. What's happened to us? But there was a day <clears throat> we were so excited about Jesus, we wanted everybody to know him. And the fire has subsided. We talk about everything but Christ. We talk about ball teams and politics and and world events. We can talk about everything, the economy, the gas prices. We talk about everything but Jesus. What happened to us? There was a day we wept for sinners, didn't we? You remember when you used to pray for your family with tears, fast and pray? You remember God would wake you up in the middle of the night praying for somebody that needed Jesus? What's happened to us? We've lost our burden and we've, we've lost our brokenness. When was the last time you made this prayer your prayer? Lord, save him now. And, and prayed it believingly that God was a, actually able to do that. I tell you, a community like this with churches on every corner is full of religious people who do not know God. And you know what they need? They need true salvation. 
And you know when it's going to come? When some of us who are saved, who do know the Lord, get serious about the Lord Jesus having the honor He deserves and us desiring for those people to know His salvation. Now look at the end of the prayer. Look at it. In verse number 9, Hosanna to the Son of David. It's a, it's a prayer with assurance. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It's on his good name. It's on his character. As a matter of fact, this, this word Hosanna was actually used for needy people who came to the king for help. Do you remember that woman who came to King David one day and said, Help, O king. She used this word, Hosanna. Help me. Save me. Send prosperity. Dear, dear, dear king, I need you. Look, when we come to him, our great king, a greater king than David, we are coming with authority because we know that he is more than enough. Look at the end of verse number 9. Hosanna in the highest. Don't miss the highest. See, we get pretty stuck down here in the nasty now and now, don't we? Some of you are stuck in your circumstances. You're stuck. You're just stuck in what's going on, and your mind, your emotions is all stuck with your head down. No, lift up your head. Get your head up and get your eyes back on the Lord. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of this world will grow strange and dim in the light of His glory and grace. Look, forget the lowest. Let's get back to the highest. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Look, when you see God high, holy, exalted on the throne of the universe, it is a reminder, it gives assurance that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or even think according to His power that works in us. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Dear Lord, give us some of God's people that with authority and assurance come boldly to the throne of grace again and learn how to pray this way. Hosanna is a prayer word. May I tell you about the greatest prayer meeting I was ever in? I've been in lots of prayer meetings through the years. I would argue probably hundreds of them. The greatest one that I was ever in was on a Monday night in Knoxville. We had a Monday night prayer meeting every week. We prayed for lots of things. Typically, the pastor or one of us that led would give a short word from the Bible, something just to kind of prompt our prayers and get us started. And then we would spend the entire hour praying for needs. People would stand and pray. Sometimes we'd get on our knees and pray. Sometimes we'd get partners and pray. As a general rule, every few minutes, the, the person leading the prayer meeting would, would say, let's pray for this now and, and, and give a little guidance to it. Let's pray for this now and give a little guidance to it. And they were always sweet meetings, good meetings. They weren't preaching meetings, testifying meetings, uh, talking meetings. They were praying meetings. And we had a great numbers of people that would come to them on Monday night. I believe it was one of the great engines that moved that church forward. One Monday night, I slipped into the prayer meeting, and I was sitting at a little chapel we had off to the wing, off to the side, near the back. The pastor walked in. It was very unusual. He walked to the front, and he said, Folks, he said, I can't explain this to you. He said, But I, I really believe tonight we're supposed to concentrate our prayers on one thing. And he said, I'm, I'm not going to talk tonight. I'm not going to give any direction to it. He said, May God lead it. He said, I really believe we're supposed to just begin to pray for our lost people and really beseech heaven that those people would be saved. And he said, let's waste no time about it. Let's begin. And he sat down. And for an hour, he never stood up. He didn't need to. He was quiet for a moment. And somewhere near the back, on the other side of the little chapel from where I was, a young woman stood up. She began to pray. She was weeping. I still remember her sobs as she cried out for a soul, someone she loved. And with sincere groans, she said, oh God, save him, please save him. She didn't say amen, we weren't done. She sat down, and as soon as she sat down, somebody else stood up and began to pray. And they sat down, and somebody else stood up. And for an hour it went on solid hour and it passed like that I can't explain it to you I'm not trying to be spooky or mystical I'm just telling you the truth it was like the Lord sat down on the place 
I've prayed with lots of people. I've been in lots of prayer meetings that were good meetings. But I had never been in a meeting where I sensed so near to me the very presence of the Holy One. It was like you could just reach out and touch Him. The Lord was among us. In fact, at one point in the prayer meeting that night, I, I didn't want to be disrespectful, but I opened my eyes. I looked around. I just wanted to see. And all over that building, people bowed low before God, crying out to the Lord. There was no disorder, no no, no fanaticism about it. It was just people praying, save now. And I'm going to tell you what I believe. When the Hosanna comes back to our hearts, we'll see God do something. Would you like to see God do something this week? Let's take a church vote on it. How many you like to see God do something this week? Then let the people of the Lord rediscover Hosanna. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit. And don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.